Welcome to the Wicked Web Sui Weave Podcast. I'm your host, Ryan McKern. In tonight's episode, we will read through a few ghost stories of Ireland, seeking tales of the unexplained. Through Samhain and through March, I invite you to join me. For stories that have been passed down through oral tradition... All accounted and recorded by the school children of the Irish Folklore Commission in the 1930s. And thank you again for joining me in the wicked webs we weave. Bonjour and bienvenue. Our first story is entitled Ghost of Bobby Ball is Still Remembered. The story is reproduced with the kind permission of the Westmeath Examiner. The name Bobby Vaughn may not be widely known across Westmeath, but it will take a long time for his name to disappear from the lore of Rockforge Bridge, Dallystown, Gainstown, and Gay Brook. For thirty years, this ghost terrorized locals until finally banished into the waters of Low and El by a priest still revered today. Bobby Bond was believed to be the ghost of Louis Cole Robert Rochford, born 1743 past 1797, who was known by the nickname presumably because he had white hair. Rochford, who lived in Dunbowden Park, was the son of the wicked Earl Robert Rochford, first Earl of Belvedere, and his wife, the unfortunate Mary Molesworth, who was kept prisoner at Gal's Town House. Legend has it at the instigation of Lieutenant Colonel Rochford, a man named Peter Dalton was tried wrongly convicted of burglary. The unfortunate Dalton was sentenced to be hanged, and it is claimed that he has approached the gallows, he turned to his accuser, and gave him a chilling warning. It's me today, he said, but it will be you tomorrow. Rochford did indeed die, not the next day, but about a month later, on October 17, 1797, he was murdered on his own doorstep at Dunbowden Park, and said for years that the stain of his blood could not be removed from the stone steps. The story goes that there was a big party at the Dunbowden that night. In the course of the evening, a stranger knocked at the door asking to speak with the master of the house. A footman fetched Lieutenant Colonel Rochfort, but very soon afterwards, an unmerciful scream was heard, and Rochford was found lying in a pool of blood. His throat had been cut. Not long afterwards, rumors began that Rochford's ghost could be encountered at a lone whitehorn bush on the Carrick Caleb Bride Road, between the two gates of the lodge to Dunboat and Demons. The ghost was dreaded, and he enjoyed a thirty year period of terrorizing the locals. The end of Bobby Bond's reign of terror began when a member of the family with the surname Fahi, who lived in Carrick, opposed the Tundadam Deer Park, was dying. The family sent for the famous Timothy Shanley, parish priest, Father Milltown in Meaden, who lived at West Lodge Kilbride. Father Shanley administered for the dying practitioner before giving the happy news that the person would recover. The head of the family left with Father Shanley as the priest set out for home to accompany him some of the way. After a time, the two men parted company, but a few minutes later, Father Shaney came back in search of Mr. Fahi, telling him he had just encountered what he described as the devil himself on the road. The priest asked Mr. Fahi if he believed in God, and then whether he was a brave man or a coward. I hope that I can be seen as a brave man, Father, Fahi responded. Relieved at Fahi's answer, the priest said next, Well, come with me, and don't be afraid. The devil himself is down the road. Together the two men proceeded to the spot on the road. The lone white thorn tree stood, and there in front of them was the ghost of Bobby Bond, who refused to let the two pass. Father Shanley turned to Fahi and told him not to be afraid, and assured him, if he followed his instructions, no harm would come to him. 
The two stood close to each other, and Father Shanley poured holy water in a circle around to protect them from the devil's spirit. Father Shanley began to pray, and this infuriated the ghost, which then began spitting fire and brimstone, before it transformed into a ball of fire, rolling furiously to low anel. Locals claim that the point where the ghost of Bobby Bond entered the lake, between the froth and the water, at Rin Point, in the parish of Moy Liscar, it's always choppy, a sign that the tormented soul still haunts the waters. The exorcism took its toll on Father Shaney. He aged quickly, and his hair turned white. Father Shanley asked Mr. Fahey to promise him that he would not tell the story until after Father's death. Mr. Fahey kept the promise, eventually telling the story at the priest's graveside on the day of his funeral at Carrick Graveyard. The murder of Robert Rochford was never identified, but in the story handed down in the area, it was held that the murder was actually the ghost of Peter Dalton. The legend examined in research for the Gatestown Gaybrook book, Children of the Mounds, published in 2003, and the writers were able to verify Rochford's parts in the arrest in September 1797 that led to the hanging of Peter Dalton and ten other at Mulligar Gaul. Out of Father Shaney's actions grew a devotion to him and the annual Good Friday pilgrimage to his grave. Robert Rochford was married twice, firstly to a daughter of John Nugent of Colonists, and later to a daughter of William Smith of Dumcree. He left no descendants. His Dunbowden estate passed to the Cooper family of Marquis Castle in Sligo. The house was burned to the ground during the troubles of the early 1920s. The McDonald family, Patrick then, his son, Beanie, owned the estate for a while. A syndicate brought it after the McDonald's, and the next owner, Griefel Arms, were prior to Christy May, prior to its acquisition by the end O'Callaghan family of Talio Stud. I hope you enjoyed that tale. Much more folklore to come from Ireland's scariest stories. Up next in the Wicked Webs We Weave podcast, Ireland Ghost Stories Folklore Special, we examine an extract from The Darkness Echoing, and I quote, What about the ghost? I asked. Gillian O'Brien toured some of Ireland's darkest heritage sites carrying out research for her book, The Darkness Echoing, exploring Ireland's places of famine, death, and rebellion. A 2020 release and an Irish Times top 10 bestseller. In the following extract, Gillian writes about visiting the reputedly haunted Leap Castle in County Offaly. Recounts one of her favorite ghost stories and describes an unsettling experience in the stores of the National Museum of Ireland, Collins Barracks, Dublin, reproduced here with the kind permission of the author, of course. As a child, I was terrified of ghost stories. The one I recall most clearly is the one time and again on my trips around the country. Almost identical versions are associated with Loftus Hall, Ireland's most haunted house. Castletown House in County Kildare and the Hellfire Club, a gambling and drinking den on Montpellier Hill in County Dublin. I heard the story first at the Hellfire Club when I was 11 years old. Cub Scouts sitting around a campfire not far from where the story is set. The Hellfire Club met in a hunting lounge built in 1725 for William Connolly, the richest man in Ireland and Speaker of the House of Commons. After Connellan's death, the lodge is taken over by the Hellfire Club, a group of well-to-do noblemen who drank and gambled and carosed there, men described by Jonathan Swift as a brace of monsters called blasters or blasphemers or bacchanalians. There were rumors that they took part in satanic rituals and at every meeting in the empty chair was left for the devil. Late one evening, a handsome stranger arrived to play cards. He took the chair reserved for the devil and refused to give it up. As the night wore on, the members of the Hellfire Club became drunk and poorer, using huge sums of money to the mysterious stranger. 
And as dawn broke, one of them bent down to pick up a card from the floor and noticed that the stranger had a cloven hoof. Suddenly sober, he screamed, and as he did, the stranger disappeared, leaving behind only a smell of sulfur. That story kept me awake my tent all night. I don't believe in ghosts, she recalled. But I still wasn't keen on visiting Leap Castle, the world's most haunted castle, on my own. So I persuaded Misha to come with me. As we approached the castle, we could see crows flying out from the top of what appeared to be a ruin. Perhaps the set nav had brought us to the wrong place. But as we drove down the avenue, I realized that parts of the castle, a 15th century tower house, flanked by neo-Gothic wings, were intact. I pressed the battery-operated plastic bell taped, rather incongruously, to an imposing oak door, and the door was opened by a man who seemed to be both caretaking and the guide. It was a bright July morning, but we were ushered into a dark room illuminated by a large fire in one corner. A number of people were already seated there, and fifteen sets of eyes glanced at us before immediately returning to the flames. I think we stumbled into a cult meeting, Misha whispered, as we took our seats at the back. I was hoping to be regaled with ghost stories, but instead we listened to a lengthy fireside chat that included the history of the castle, which was built by the O'Carls, who controlled the surrounding area. They held it until the 1640s, when it was confiscated by Cromwellian troops, who granted it to a soldier of fortune, Jonathan Darby. The local history was supplemented by a sadly inaccurate history of Ireland, and I sighed as I heard yet again that the Irish had been slaves, and then that the transportation had continued up to the 20s. Eventually, I interrupted. What about the ghost? I asked. It appeared that many of them were mercenaries, the O'Carrolls had hired, been turned on. After a successful battle or raid, the mercenaries were invited to a celebratory banquet where they were poisoned. This wasn't the worst of it. Other unwelcome guests were thrown into a gap in the dining hall wall and fell several floors to the Orbleet, a dungeon. At the bottom, the lucky ones landed on a spike and died soon after. The unlucky were left to starve to death and forgotten. As the word obelit suggests, according to our guide, when the obelit was emptied, hundreds of skeletons were discovered. It's no wonder their unhappy spirits are said to stalk the castle. After the fireside tales, we were sent off to explore the castle unchaperoned. Much of it is derelict, the rest is shabby but cozy. Disrepair. There's an electric collection of art books, musical instruments, and religious paraphernalia eclectically. There are winding staircases that appear to lead nowhere into tiny, purposeless rooms. Misha and I climbed the dark, uneven stairs to the derelict, bloody chapel at the top of the castle where two O'Carroll brothers had an argument one murdered the other. Reports of bright lights emanating from the chapel persisted ever since. Certainly, there were plenty of bright lights when we visited since we wandered around using torches to illuminate the way. Several members of our tour group refused to go into the chapel, preferring to stay in the great hall. It seemed a poor choice as it left them hovering near the obelite, where ghosts seemed far more likely to emerge and close to the minstrel's gallery, where a terrifying haunting had occurred. In the early 20th century, Mildred Darby had hosted seances in the castle and she reported that after one of them, as she stood in the gallery looking down on the hall, she felt somebody put a hand onto my shoulder. Thin, gaunt, shadowy. Its face was human. Its eyes, which seemed half decomposed in black cavities, stared into mine. The horrible smell came up to my face, giving me a deadly nausea. It was the smell of decomposing corpse. I sniffed the air, but detected only the faint odors of cats. And after we'd explored the castle, we returned to the fireside and listened to one of the visitors talk about how she had felt the essence of the place and had filled her spirit with joy. 
So many people had apparently been murdered. But then, as Misha observed, I was not really in a position to criticize. Still, I rolled my eyes a little until Misha leaned over and pointed out that the woman beside me had an activated a ghost hunting app on her phone and was staring at the electromagnetic field meter. I could see bars rising and falling on the screen. We decided it was time to leave. Just minutes from the castle, we passed St. Kerrigan's rag bush, an old hawthorn with scraps of clothing tied to the branches. St. Kieran founded a monastery nearby in the 5th century. There was and still is a belief that if you tied a rag to the bush and prayed for a particular intention, by the time the rag, rag had rotted away, the prayer would be answered. So strong is his belief in this bush, a road widening plan was adjusted so that the road goes around the hawthorn. I wondered whether the hawthorn was saved to ward off the spirits that allegedly emanated from Leap Castle. Rag trees and saints and ghosts. The unholy trinity of pagan, Christian, and supernatural belief all bound together. The story of Ireland in one hawthorn bush. One of my favorite ghost stories has no ghosts at all. When working on the developments of the Heritage Center at Nano Nagel Place, I read the annals kept by the Ursuline and Presentation nuns who had lived on site. One night in September 1784, two would-be burglars placed their ladder against the wall of the convent. As they climbed the ladder, they woke one of the nuns, who sailed out of her cell, just as one would. The thieves that reached the top of the ladder, on looking through the window, the first object he held was a nun arrayed in the fascinating costume of an Ursuline night dress. The analyst recorded, White Veil black band, short cloak. The burglars would, in all likelihood, never have seen a nun before. But one glance at her was uh, effectual as a sight of a constable. It's no wonder he thought he'd seen a ghost. The story of the convent goblin spread rapidly through the city, and the convent analyst noted the convent was never threatened again. Though I had no ghostly visions on my tour, I did have one disconcerting experience. Late one evening, I was in the stores of the National Museum at Collins Barracks with Kirita Brenda Malone, looking at artifacts associated with death as we sat there surrounded by a whole smorgasbord of them. We heard a loud metallic clatter above us. Oh, that must be the security guards moving the metal trays I was using earlier, said Brenda casually. A few minutes later, we heard women singing at the other end of the floor. That'll be the cleaners, Brenda said. We returned to admiring Michael Collins' beautifully embroidered slippers. Later, as we were leaving, we went up to the floor with the trays. The trays hadn't been moved at all. As we left the building, we ran into the security guard. No, he told us. There hadn't been any cleaners on our floor that evening. There hadn't been anyone at all. Later, I was told that the ghost of a young woman haunts the building. In the 18th century, when it was a British military barracks, she attended a party hosted by some young officers. In the course of the evening, she fell from a window and later died from her injuries, but not before telling her doctor that the officers had pushed her. No one was ever charged with her murder, and her ghost is said to walk the corridors seeking justice. For more exciting stories of Gillian's book, The Darkness Echoing, visit gillianobrien.net. Merci beaucoup, mon ami. And thank you again for joining me on this episode of the Wicked Webs We Weave podcast where we explore Irish ghost stories and folklore. I will have more stories this March in celebration of the Irish heritage and ghost lore that I love so much. Once again, I would like to thank OurIrishHeritage.org and Gillian O'Brien's book research for making this episode. I hope you are warm by the fire. Sleep tight, my friends, and until we see you again, au revoir.